that much Perl 6 code, which is interesting. But uh, so the native call function is, so this is sort of a poll here. Uh, who thinks the top code is the most scary code? <laughs> that's an actual snippet of code from the implementation of the native call functions, by the way. That's actual li living C code. It's for reading a 32-bit integer from a struct. So is that scary code? Maybe. And you may also find the bottommost code to be kind of scary as well. That's, that generates an infinite array called f, which is the list of Fibonacci numbers in Perl 6. So hopefully my talk will be sort of in between here. It will, there, I will talk about C. So if you're scared of pointers, this may be a scary talk because even though this is for interfacing with libraries from Perl 6. The fact that you are interfacing with native libraries means that you need to cope with pointers. You're not actually programming in Perl 6, you just think you are. You're actually programming in C because all of the data structures come from C and you need to cope with the realities of C because we can't help you that much. So how does native call work? Uh, there are basically there are two features in Perl 6 that make native call possible. Um, the first of these is something that Jonathan sort of touched upon earlier today is the fact that we have a type system. We have an actual working type system and that inclu includes subroutine signatures so that our subroutines can actually be annotated with hey this has this many parameters and it takes parameters of these types. Which means that for a subroutine that is properly annotated with types, we know what types these will correspond to in C. So we can actually marshal a call into the correct thing for a C subroutine. Assuming of course that the types are not in something completely insane that C has no idea how to cope with. Yes, if you're wondering about the picture, they are the insane clown posse who are curious about how magnets work. Um, so the type system is a reasonably well-publicized feature by now. Uh, but the other feature, which is perhaps more important for native call, is something which is called representational polymorphism, which is a really nice word. And basically it means that we can decouple what an object contains and how that is represented in memory. So the fact that an object has four attributes is one thing, how you want to store that in memory is something completely different. So in Perl 6, you can use this representational polymorphism to tag your classes as, I really need this to be stored in memory so that it can be passed off to C, like a struct, for example which means that we can just write classes and say, hey, this needs to go to C. And then the compiler will do it for you. And then of course we need to implement some plumbing and guts to actually pass all of this massive pointers off to C. But since I have done that work, you don't have to bother with it. <laughs> so the basic types of C for some value of basic are these types here. You have characters and shorts and various kinds of integer numbers and we have some floating point numbers and we have void pointers, the evergreen, it's a pointer to something. Who cares? Who knows? Points to something. And somewhat special case for us is the character pointer which is of course a string because since we are not insane, we actually use strings for many things where C programmers would have an integer and you need to put magical values into magical positions in the bit string of the integer and then that does the right thing. And then something else entirely happens if you happen to put something wrong. 
So these correspond to sized integer types in the Perl 6 language, because we have those. And we have sized numeric types for the floating points. And then the native call library provides you with a type called a pointer, which is a pointer. And we can also interoperate relatively directly with Perl level strings. We can automatically convert them to a zero terminated string of characters so that we can pass them off to C. Because it turns out you want to do that a lot. So a very simple example would be something like this. The C math library provides you with cos, the cosine function. And it takes a double argument and it returns a double value, which is, of course, the cosine of the number you passed in. Using native call, that looks like this. You say sub, the name of the function you want to call, and then it takes a num64 argument and it returns a num64 value, which is the cosine of the number. And it is native. So we apply this native trait to say that this function is a native function. And then within the parents, <laughs> yeah, I, I, mine is red. Um, I just forgot that I had, had it. So we can say that it is native and we have to specify the name of the library that provides the function, of course, because we, we need to know where to look for the symbol. And the math library is very clearly named libem, because that's how C works, I guess. And then we have the curly braces for the body of the function. And inside there, you can put pretty much whatever you want in the whole wide world. It will never get called. Uh, but putting the star there is generally a good idea because if for some reason the call doesn't get overridden, because that's, th that's what this native trait does. It twiddles with the function so that when the function is invoked, instead of going through the normal Perl function calling, you get the call to the native function. So if that for some reason doesn't happen and the body of this function gets called, you will get a, a big explosion and an error, which is generally what you want if you thought you were going to call a native function. So just putting this star here will cause an, cause an exception to be thrown, which is generally what you want. Of course, the function not getting overridden should never ever happen. That would be a terrible bug in the library and you should file a bug report immediately so that we can fix it. But that's basically why I put it there. You can put anything. Or you could put die. Something went terribly, terribly wrong if you want to, if you want a different error message. So that's the general flow of calling something foreign with native call. You use native call and then you say sub the name of the function in the library you want to call and then is native the name of the library that owns the symbol. And you uh, annotate with the correct types or else the types will get marshaled incorrectly and the C code will be terribly confused. So a slightly more complicated example would be something like fopen, which opens files, of course. fopen returns a file pointer. And the file pointer is actually specified by the C standard to be opaque. It's, it's just a pointer, and you are not allowed to, to look inside it. The contents are secret. And it takes two strings, the path to the file that you want to open, and the mode of the file you want to open, of course. And it's basically the same thing as cosine to do this. It takes a stir and another stir. Those are strings. And it returns a pointer to the file object that you want, that is the file handle. And here I use a different trick. So the is native trait takes a string parameter. So if you pass it an undefined string, that's what undefs look like in Perl 6. There is no longer 
a single undefined value, there are typed undefined values. So the, the type object of any type is the typed undefined. So if you send an undefined string to isNative, it will basically do the same as DL open null. And DL, what DL open null does is that it opens the currently running executable for looking for symbols, and then you can find load symbols from yourself. So this is a very easy way to get at things that are provided in the standard library, for example. So you can just open yourself and find the standard library functions from yourself. So we can do that to find the fopen subroutine. And then this will, this will let us access files through the C API. Of course, it won't actually be faster than using the Perl 6 API because there's overhead involved in marshalling things back and forth between the C library, but this is a very good example. So even though you could do all of your file manipulations through C, you don't really want to, but it's a very useful example here. So, but this pointer shenanigan is kind of, yes, that's how we work with things in C, there we were just throwing pointers at the wall, but given that we're programming in a slightly less insane language than C, we could use some more types, some more type checking. So what we can do is that we can have a class called file, which is is wrapper C pointer. So this is using the representational polymorphism trick. So we have this class, and we say that I want this to be something that is a pointer. It's a pointer that I can't introspect, but it, it's a pointer. And then we can have type checked file handles from C. And then we can put inside the class two subs, and since these are lexically scoped with the my keyword, the actual native subroutines are private to the class. So the outside of, of your class, the rest of the Perl 6 world does not need to know about these native functions. Only the implementation of the class needs to know about them. So here I've just put in fopen, which opens the file, and fflush, which of course, flushes things you've written to a file handle to disk. It's a bit pointless without actually being able to write to the file, but you know, for the sake of example, I will show you a bigger, a bigger thing in a bit. And then we can implement new, the constructor. We simply override the constructor to, instead of constructing a Perl 6 object, we say, return what you get from fopen. So you call fopen, and fopen, since it has been specified to return a file pointer, and since file is a C pointer object, that works fine. So the value of the return value from fopen will be created into one of these file objects, which we can then return from the constructor. And since this is a Perl method, we can provide a Perlish interface to the open, so that if you just say, a new file and then a file name, it will be opened in the read mode by default. If you don't ask for anything else, you will get an input file. So we can have default values or def default arguments. And then, no, that's right. This is why I shouldn't have been talking to Liz before, before this talk and rather been checking my slide. There's a typo in my slides. Uh, the, the signature there to flush should be empty. It should not say self there. I'm terribly sorry. So the method flush just calls f flush with the invocant argument. Um, and that will, of course, just flush the, f the file handle. So this way you can interact with native functions, but using classes and methods and the same structure as you would have if you implemented things in Perl 6 but you can call out to the native library that you need so that you can provide a Perlish interface to native code. It doesn't have to work exactly like the native code just because it is, it's a C library, therefore it mu must be a mass of very long file names or uh, function names. 
we can wrap it in classes. And similarly, we can make structs with a thing. I couldn't think of any good examples from the standard library, unfortunately, to show a, an actual working example of a struct. Or the only example I could think of was fstat, and that, that's a struct with something like 12 members or something, so it, would, it wouldn't fit on the slide. So therefore, you have this fictional example which is a struct which has an int 8 and an int 16, so a character and a short. And so here we can have actual data members in our class. A C pointer class obviously can't have any members because the pointer is opaque. We don't know the internal structure of the thing that is pointed at. But here, since we know that it's a struct, we can lay things out in memory the way structs have to be laid out in memory. So here, for example, this will give us a struct where the C memory is first, the first eight bits, or the first byte, will be the storage for the foo parameter. And then there will be a single byte of padding before the next two bytes, which is the two bytes for the short, because that's how structs have to be laid out in memory in C. They have, there are alignment requirements for differently sized things. So we compute the alignment and lay things out just like in C. And using, and here we can also use the same trick as we used for the file API where we have private subs, which are the actual native functions that do things on the struct. And then we can expose those methods through actual normal <laughs> Perl methods with n sane Perl APIs to work with so that users don't have to cope with C in the same way as us. So it's the Perl 6 mantra of torturing the implementer for the benefit of the user. But note that we currently only support handling structs as pointers. So value structs, so struct foo without the star is currently unimplemented because the semantics are a bit hairy. Um, so we haven't implemented that just yet, but we have pointers. And then arrays are almost like normal Perl arrays. You declare your array as a C array because it's a C array and it has to be typed, of course. You can't say, I want a C array, and then neglect to say what it, uh, is, what it is an array of, because an array of bytes is different from an, from an array of longs, or an array of floats, for that matter. So we need to know what it is an array of, so that, well, first of all, so that we know how large the elements are, and also how to interpret them when we get them back from C. Because in, in C, um, a, an array can be anything. I mean, you'll just get a bunch of bytes back and the interpretation of them is up to you. And the Perl 6 compiler is not magical, so we it can't magically figure out, oh, this is an array of floats because reasons. You need to say, is it an array of floats or is it an array of integers? And then you can wrap malloc. If for some reason you need to wrap malloc, it's, again, a useful example, even if this is something you should never, ever, ever do. Um, so we can make malloc a native function that takes an int 64, because that's what size t is on my machine. And it returns an array of bytes. And it's loaded from the C library. And then we can magically create arrays of bytes using malloc. Of course, that's basically what allocating a new array using CRA does. So you don't actually need to do that by hand. The array is also backed by a different wrapper, but I'm not going to show you how that works because you shouldn't ever need that. And arrays come sort of in two flavors. You can have what are basically managed or semi-managed arrays, 
which are, are if you create a CRA in Perl, we can know a tiny bit about it. We know a bit more about it than we normally would, so that, so that we can help you with the bounds, for example. We know how long the array is if it's been created in Perl, so that we can say, you can't read this. It's outside of the bounds of the array. But if an array has been returned from C, like this array from malloc, you are on your own. We will happily let you read from whatever offset you want, because this is a C array. We have to do that. We don't actually know how long the array is. So you need to keep track of the offsets, just like you would in a C program. Because, as I said, this is, this is still C programming, even if we're writing Perl 6 code. So keep track of the offsets, or the code is probably going to segfault, because that's what C code does. And we can also do callbacks. So if you have a C function that takes a callback, and this is, so for those of you who have forgotten how the callback syntax works in C, which is basically what, I, what happens every time I need to cope with callbacks in C because the syntax is terrible. This is a function which returns void called callbacker. And it takes a single argument, which is a function. And that, is, that argument is called CB. It's a pointer to a function that returns int and takes void. It's a zero argument function that returns an int. In Perl 6, that signature is like this. Then we say it's ampersand. It's a callable thing. And then within the parens, we have the signature. And this dash dash greater than arrow is an inline way of annotating return types, which you have to use for callbacks to annotate the return type. And here we say it returns an int. You can use this same syntax for functions as well. So it's here sub malloc could be sub malloc int 64 dollar dash dash greater than CRA int 8, and that would be semantically equivalent to this returns CRA trait. I just prefer the returns thing to the inline there. But since here we can't really apply the trait, because that would make the parsing completely hairy, uh, we need to use this form here. And it's also very important to use the, a space there because of how Perl 6 is parsed. If there was no space there, it would be treated as a function call to a function called CB, if I remember correctly, which is not what you want here. You want a parameter called CB, which has a signature. So you need space there. And this native function then can take a Perl function. And the Perl function will be called correctly when the C code invokes its function pointer. Because we create the correct trampoline for the C code to invoke, and then things happen in the, in the nice and neat way. And you can, of course, access globals, because some C libraries use globals, even though global variables are terrible and you shouldn't do that. C libraries still do that. Especially the standard library, for example, which has erno, the error number for the, pr the last operation that went wrong. Then you can bind. You have to use the binding here, colon equals. Then you can bind a global from a library, the name of the global you want to bind, and then the type, of course, of the global. because. This is, again, looked up using the DL uh, library. So we just dig out a pointer with DL sim, and then we need the type annotation to figure out, it's a pointer. Please tell me how I need to dereference it. Is, it. is it an int pointer? Is it a float pointer? What kind of pointer is this? It's currently read-only, so you can't actually write to Erno using Perl 6 at the moment. 
I'm not sure if you ever would want to write to Erno, but you can't, anyways, yet. Yes, Patrick. Um, yes, you probably would want to do that. I'm not sure if you can. I didn't actually implement this bit of the library, so I can't remember uh, off the cuff. Yes, you would definitely want to be able to type global. I just can't remember if it is typed. I'm sorry. Um, but yes, it should, be, it should be possible to type it. Although I suspect you might not be able to, because I think it does shenanigans using proxies or something to route the, the read of the variable through to the C library. Because, yeah, this is one of those things where you have to cope with a lot of pointers and exposing the correct semantics through Perl is sort of a work in progress. And, of course, sometimes you really need to cast pointers. It, it feels dirty and you really want to avoid it, but somet sometimes a library just returns a pointer and then you don't actually know how to interpret that pointer until further down the line for some bizarre reason, usually because the, the library API is weird, but you didn't design the library, you just need to use it. So we provide you with the opportunity to take one pointer thing, so that's something like a C array or a C struct or a C pointer and turn it into something else. Usually that's I have a C struct of one kind, and it turns out that I need to reinterpret it as a different kind of struct pointer. And then you can use this native cast function. But of course, that's sort of, it sh there should be this little glass window in front of it saying break glass in case of emergency or something, because it's pretty terrible to do. So, the big caveats when wrapping C code, beyond the obvious fact of you are actually writing in C, this is going to hurt. Uh, because you, are, you think you are writing Perl, but you're actually writing C. So we don't actually support struct and arrays as value types, which means that something like, um, if you have a struct definition that looks like um, struct foo, and then it has car eight. Yeah, let's call it bytes. Something like that, which has an embedded array of bytes inside it. We don't actually support that yet. Again, for hairy semantics issues of Perl 6 operating mostly around things being being references, and if we return a pointer to that, then, then scary things happen. Uh, so you need to do something slightly ugly, like having a C struct, and then it has eight character, character members, which is the character for the first element of the array, the character for the second member of the array, and so on and so forth. It's ugly, but it works for if you have an embedded struct in the same way you have to do even more hairy things because you have to do the padding and such on your own there's also the fact that an int is not necessarily an int or at least the int on one machine is not necessar necessarily the same as an int on a different machine so which we also don't yet support um, because these architecture-dependent things are annoying, but that's mostly a question of getting it done. Mostly a question of me getting VirtualBox up and running and actually making sure it works on 32-bit machines as well as 64-bit machines. Because what do you mean not everyone has a 64-bit machine? Uh, and then finally, there are unions. Um, Conceptually, they're very similar to structs. I mean, they look even look the same in C code, 
But again, there are some tricky implementation things hiding below the surface, which I haven't quite figured out yet, so that's why they are not implemented yet. And then extra finally, there are of course macros. The bane of anything like this is macros, because a macro isn't actually C. The macro is handled by the compiler. Or if you want to be pedantic, it's actually handled by the preprocessor, which comes before the compiler, but it's implemented in a single pass in most modern compilers. So if the library provides functionality through C macros, you are basically screwed. Or at least you need to re-implement the macro in Perl 6 code working on the C types because the macro is, of course, not visible. It's just string expanded into the source file when the library is compiled. So the macro is secret. Unless for some reason you have uh, a debug binary with macros embedded, those exist, but then you need to do library, or then you need to spelunk through the bin binary to find the source of the macro and then recompile the source of the macro into Perl code, which I don't think anyone ever wants. So it's very rare for this to be a problem, but some libraries actually do provide non-trivial things as macros, like curses. Some curses implementation, implementations provide non-trivial and quite important functionality as macros, which is very annoying because you can't wrap them from a foreign function library. So that's sort of the thing that is fundamentally unfixable, sadly, and potentially also a complete wrecker. So that's sort of my... Uh, those are my slides, and then I have uh, a slightly larger example that I was planning to show you how to actually extend this file thing. I just need to make my screen be the same as your screen. That's big enough. Embiggened. I think that's big enough for everyone to see. Or maybe not Jonathan, but Jonathan knows all of this already, so he doesn't need to see. <laughs> so we can provide the class called C file, which is wrapper C pointer, and it has F open and F flush. This is the same code as I had on the slide. So of course, that's perhaps not very terribly useful since we can't actually write to files because we haven't wrapped f write yet. So let's put in f my sub f write, which takes some arguments and oh, three of those. It returns an int 32, I remember. It's native stir like so. So what's the signature of f write? Does anyone actually remember without looking it up what f write takes? Because I don't? No. So fwrite takes a pointer, a size, and a count. And then finally, the stream. So let's copy this so we don't forget. And then right. So this corresponds in Perl 6 to something like a C array of int 8s. So that's an array of bytes. The most generic type we can have. And then just dollar, that's the Perl 6 syntax for here's an argument, I don't care what it's called. It's just, it has an anonymous name. Because this is like, yes? Yes, if you want to be helpful, that would actually be a good idea. So here we can, I can't remember what the parameter from, oh, yes. It's called ptr, of course. Right. The ever helpful uh, name of the C world. Um, let's just comment that out. 
So put it, and then there's a size T on my machine. That's a 64-bit int, which is called size, and then another size T, which is called nmemb, and then a C file, which is the file, or it's called stream, actually. Yes, the number of members to write. All right. Well, no one's going to check my spelling here because this, so, but yeah. But yeah, that's the write. So now we can implement a method called write, which takes a string. Let's call it stir. Because we don't actually want to punish our users for using our library and g exposing them with this horrendous API. Because our, our users are generally just going to want to write a string to a file. So let's let them do that. So the first thing we have to do is to convert our string, which is not an array of bytes. Remember, please, strings are not bytes. And if you are ever confused about this, please remember, strings are not bytes. If you think that strings are arrays of bytes, you are going to have a terrible time. You are really going to have a bad time. Because encodings are a thing, and even if everything is the same encoding, Unicode has to be normalized first to be compared sanely. Strings are not bytes. And helpfully, Perl 6 strictly enforces this distinction. You are not allowed to look at strings as bytes. So first, we have to decode it, which is, no, we have to encode it. I keep mixing those up. So we say stir encode. And because it is the only sane option, we encode it as UTF-8. If you can choose your encoding, use UTF-8. It's the useful thing to do. And then we need a C array of int 8s, which we can call putter, because that's what C calls it, which is just a new array. And then we need to copy the bytes. For up to bytes LMs, so iterate up to the number of elements minus one from zero. This is basically where in C you would say int i and then for i equals zero, semicolon i less than length, semicolon i plus plus. This is the same thing, it's just less annoying. And then we can say putter i equals bytes i. We need to do this by hand. Because I haven't yet implemented the same API functions to simply convert a string into an, an, an array of bytes. But nat the native call library should have that. And we also need to use a native call, or this is not going to work. There. So now we have a C array of bytes, which we can actually use. So now we can call fwrite with putter. The size of our individual elements is 1 because the size of a byte in C is actually, or the size of a character in C is one, even if it is not a single byte. If it were seven bits, it would still be one, because that's defined in the standard. And then here, we are writing bytes, elements, number of these things, and we are writing them to ourselves. And then, of course, f write returns a return value, and that is the number of bytes, which we may or may not want to use further down the line. In, for example, in new, we can do error checking relatively simple. We can say my C file f equals f open, oh. and then die fail to open file if not f. 
So pointer types can be checked for nullness simply by using them as booleans, just like you do in C. So here, if fopen returns a null pointer, something went wrong. And then we can th throw an exception, or else we just return f. For f right, we can't do that because we need to use the function called fr, which asks a file pointer for, are you currently an in an erroneous state? But since I can't be bothered to wrap that right now, we don't check for errors. And this will work. If I say Perl 6 lib equals dot, Perl 6, we can use C file. And my C file, uh, f new test, and then the mode has to be w, because I want to write to this file. This will give me a file handle. And then there's a, the error message there is because the stringification of the file, uh, of the C pointer object is, is buggy for some reason. I have no idea who implemented that. It was certainly not me. So I can, I can wash my hands of that current bug. I just found it. And then we can write hello oh, to the file that wrote six bytes, in case you were curious. And then we can flush it. And when I now cat test, test contains hello, written through C. Aren't we clever? So that's how it works. Are there any further questions? I've taken some questions already. I guess up to and including why would you ever want to wrap a C library? Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, could you go back to the file, please, to the uh, editor? Um, yes. Oh. Editor. Ah. <laughs> Control D. Here we go. Uh, where you uh, allocate an array and uh, have that loop to copy each byte. Do you actually create a new array for every iteration there? No. Um, there's resizing logic in the C array that will only resize it every so often. So if, if a C array has been allocated in Perl, of course, we know things about it. So we can do things like resizing it and expanding the bounds. Of course, if you try to do that too much and some C code has al already taken a pointer to it and you trigger a resize, then it will get realloced, and then the C code will have the wrong pointer. So caveat emptor there. Uh, but it's basically for doing, it's a convenience for doing things like this. Because you need to allocate an array of a certain size or, and copy stuff in. So then you can just make me a new array and then just copy crap in. And then it will create an array for you. And it basically does what, it does the same thing as any C programmer has implemented, right? In a dynamically resized buffer, it, when you want to write beyond the bounds of the array, it will realloc to a to a buffer which is twice as large as the old one was. So that's how this works. Of course, if you tried to do that on an array that was returned from C, it would go kaboom. So keep your, keep your things straight. Again, just like in C. Thank you.